I'm trying again, I got kicked out of the meeting. So I'm not the only one that got kicked out of the meeting. That's, uh, that makes me feel better. <laughs> Okay, maybe it's working now. So, can anybody hear me and can anybody see my screen? <clears throat> yeah, okay, good, good. I'm trying to keep the chat window open so I can see. So, a few, uh, let's try this again. Thursday greetings, everybody. So a few a little announcements before we jump into today's lab. There is a preview of the coursework on Moodle now. So last night I uploaded, it's called Coursework Preview. And the, the source code is also there. And it's in the same area as the lecture slides for this week. It's not the final version of the coursework. It's a preview. So it, it, the, the basic idea, the requirements are not going to change. The, the only thing, the things that are going to change are the way the document is organized. It's going to be reorganized a little bit. And we're going to add more details about the submission process and how all of your files are organized during your submission. So that's what's going to change, and that should be ready within the next week. But you can certainly get started now on that coursework. That, that it's not going to change dramatically. The, the feature set, the set of features is going to be the same. The set of requirements is going to be the same. The code is going to be the same. But when we release the final version, so to speak, we will certainly let everybody know. Okay, today's lab is about coding conventions. It's a very fun lab, actually, at least it is in my opinion. This is a topic that I feel pretty passionately about, and I think a lot of people feel very passionately about this topic, actually you can get into sort of holy war discussions about it. <laughs> We're not going to do that. Oh, the deadline of the coursework has not been released. It will be in December. I know that last year it was December 13th, so it will be roughly around December 13th, but that will be also announced within the next week. Um, yes. <clears throat> Okay, so let's, yes, feel free to interrupt with any questions, uh, any comments, or anything that's on your mind. Whatever you want, just blurt it out. I don't mind being interrupted. It's boring talking to myself. I actually prefer talking to other people <laughs> than a laptop or a machine. <laughs> Um, yes, so let's talk about coding conventions. Coding conventions are exciting and they're absolutely essential. Absolutely essential. They're not to be thought of as a punishment, actually. Some people think of them as some kind of, oh no, I'm being punished by following these rules. These rules are helping you. They're helping you in a dramatic way. They're not only helping you, but they're helping other developers in a dramatic way. Like, these coding conventions improve the quality of your life and everybody's life in the entire world. Because they improve the, your life because they make your code easier to write. They, may, they, they improve other developers' lives because they make your code easier to read. And they improve the entire world's life by 
creating higher quality software. So literally we are improving the world with these coding conventions. And I know it sounds funny, because it is funny, but it's actually true. It's funny and true at the same time. <clears throat> yes, the coursework is 75% of the module. That's correct. So, writing a software, a useful software application is difficult. For some of you, this may be your first time working on a larger or a semi-larger project or a longer term project, let's say. And developing a larger application requires more knowledge than a small one. That, that's essentially what we're doing. We're, we're trying to go from small programs to large programs. And in order to do that, we need to incorporate some good practices. And this is uh, some coding guidelines. And these coding lines are these coding conventions are published in a journal. Right, so I, I published these in a journal called Advances in Computer Science and Engineering. So they've gone through a peer review process, which is a nice sanity check. And there's a copy of them on Moodle, obviously. <clears throat> yes, I tried to explain how these improve the world. Let me know if that explanation made any sense. <clears throat> so why do we follow coding conventions? So this is a tool used to combat something I call Bob's theory of software redevelopment. If we have time, I will go into Bob's theory of software redevelopment. But Bob's theory of software redevelopment describes a process by which software is written and rewritten and o like over and over and over again in this perpetual cycle. So the wheel is being reinvented over and over and over again. And illegible code is kind of the default, essentially. When a developer sits down and starts coding and they don't follow any, any rules at all, that turns into legacy code. Is everybody, does everybody uh, know this term legacy code? Has anybody heard that before? The slides have not been uploaded to Moodle, by the way. So only the original coding conventions document is uploaded to Moodle. I, I think that the slides are not really necessary. I think just the original document is necessary. But this lecture is being recorded, and you'll be able to see the slides in the recording. So, legacy code, by the way, the majority of code that exists in the universe is called legacy code. Leg we have a special guest. I guess we can't... We can't have special guests like this during normal times, but we can have special guests during these strange times. His name is King Kenny. Say hi, King. <clears throat> the, majority, <clears throat> the majority of code that exists in the world is legacy code. What is legacy code? Legacy code is code that can no longer be touched. So if you write a method or a piece of software that involves code that nobody can read, it, it, it turns into legacy code, and that is code that is, it's no longer legible, and it's so illegible that nobody wants to touch it anymore. Everybody's afraid to touch it, because they're, they think, if I touch this code, if I check it out of the repository, try to modify it, and check it back in, and I break it, I am suddenly going to be responsible for this source code file. And nobody wants to be responsible for a, a, an illegible piece of source code. 
So it turns into something called legacy code, which is actually the majority of code that exists in the universe right now. It's cold, uh, code that's very old, it's illegible, and therefore nobody wants to touch it anymore. It's like a house of cards. You, you're afraid to touch a house of cards because you don't want the whole card, uh, house of cards to, to fall. So what do you do? It, what, do you, what do people do in this case? Instead of touching legacy code, what's the alternative? Does anybody know? So the alternative of touching legacy code is to rewrite it. So instead of trying to modify somebody else's functionality and breaking it, people rewrite the code, right? And that's this wheel being invented over and over again. And we know that in, yes, refactor is, is a possible. It, it, adding another layer of abstraction Usually what happens is somebody will take a class and instead of modifying that class, they will replace it with their own version of, of their class or create a child and re-implement the functionality that they need. So we know that in reality most software projects fail. The basic philosophy behind these coding conventions is that we want to maximize code legibility. That is the basic philosophy. How do we maximize code legibility? And the reason is legible software is better software. Legible software contains fewer bugs. Legible software is more stable. Legible software is more flexible and encourages reuse. So if we want to build a successful application, we want to write, we want to follow these coding conventions and the other two key ingredients are software design principles that we're talking about and comment conventions. Okay, this is a little overview of the, the little, the tutorial. So we're going to talk about Bob's Concise Coding Conventions, the influences behind them. And the idea is the word, actually the concise is, the, is probably one of the interesting words here. The idea is you can buy entire books on coding conventions, books that are like 200 pages or 300 pages and when you have 200 pages of coding conventions, it's very difficult. Maybe it's impossible to follow them all. But what we have developed here is a concise set of conventions, so 10 of them, and they fit on one side of one sheet of paper. So you can print out the one side of one sheet of paper and hang it up, and easily follow the rules. That's the, that's the idea. So they're concise and they fit on one page. And they, they, um, they're applied to Java and C++ or other imperative object-oriented languages. And the background and references to where those rules come from and why they're there is provided on the following pages, on the supplementary pages. I don't know if we're going to have time to go into Bob's theory of software redevelopment. Maybe I'll talk about that. Uh, we'll see how, how the time goes. <clears throat> so some of the important influences that these are based on. So these are, I didn't make up the rules. The rules are from other sources and my own experience as a software developer. So there are lots of coding conventions. There's, there's coding conventions for this thing called the Visualization Toolkit, which most of you probably have never heard of. There are Java coding conventions from Sun Microsystems. There are these different books here that I've listed on that all contain coding conventions. 
So what I've done is I've tried to pick out the 10 most important ones from all of this experience and literature. I've tried to pick out the, the 10 most essential. But if you want to read more on this topic, and I encourage you to do so, you can have a look at these books. You can see one of them is 336 pages, so that's a lot. And then, of course, the, the, C, the original C++ programming book is a, is a monster. It's a thousand pages. <laughs> I do have a copy of it, by the way. Okay, so let's jump into the rules. The rule, the first rule is methods are 75 lines or less. So the idea behind that is a method, when you write a method, it should fit on one screen. It should not be necessary to scroll up and down to see the beginning method to the end. Right? It should be possible to just see the whole method from start to finish without scrolling. The only exception to this are methods with case tables or switch statements. And possibly the main method, possibly, but even the main method, I wouldn't write longer than one screen. Right. The longer the method is, the less reusable it is, and the more difficult it is to modify. Uh, I, I have stories about methods that are very, very long. <clears throat> at the last software development job that I worked at, there was a method that was like 5,000 lines long. And this was, this fit the the definition of legacy code perfectly. So if you have a method that's too long, for example 5,000 lines, it's no longer possible to modify that method without breaking it by accident. So the longer the method is, the more likely it is to break by accident. And when a method reaches a certain length, I don't know what the magic length is, but it, it reaches a certain length and then suddenly everybody's too afraid to touch it. That's the moment it becomes legacy code, right? And uh, um, methods, you know, that, that 5,000 line method that I, I uh, saw at my previous software development job was so bad and so long that it actually caused problems with the compiler. When you would compile the project, the compiler would spend like five minutes trying to compile this long method, and it actually, it actually ate away the productivity time of all the developers. So it actually slowed down the entire project, just because the compiler struggled so massively with this super long method. So, the shorter a method is, the better, essentially. <clears throat> yes. Method number two, or rule number two, is no method shall use more than five levels of indentation. Hopefully you have all seen methods that have lots and lots of levels of indentation the more levels of indentation a method use, uses, the more difficult it is to um, use and to understand and to read. Does anybody know how to avoid levels, levels of indentation in a method? Can anybody think of a way to avoid that? Does anybody know how to avoid um, too many levels of indentation? Okay, well, I'm glad we're, I'm asking this question because it's super important. You can avoid too many levels of indentation by simply uh, 
Yes, introducing helper methods. So s breaking an existing method down into more methods, right? Subdividing a method. So imagine you have a for loop, for example. You can take a for loop out of any method and put it in its own method and reduce the levels of indentation. So it's, it's, it's not, as long as the, um, the method isn't too long, it's not very difficult to refactor. The king is feeling very, the king feels very strongly about these coding conventions. So rule number three is on about the line length. So no line of code exceeds 80 characters. By the way, these are maximum. These are, so the average line of code should be far less than 80 characters. This is a, a maximum. In other words, it should not be necessary to take whatever editor you're using, whatever source code editor you're using, and make a special effort to widen the screen in order to read the single line of code. There are no exceptions to this rule, none at all. <clears throat> the reason is that lines that are too long are less legible and more difficult to debug. It's much easier to hide a bug in a very long line of code than a short one. Right? The longer the line is, the more difficult it is for the eyes to move from one line to the next. This is why when you pick up a book or you pick up a magazine or any printed medium, there are guidelines about how long a line should be. Good publishers, if you look around, good publishers use a guideline of 66 characters per line. Right? When you pick up a newspaper, there are columns. Right? And the reason there are columns is because it makes the text easier to read. If you had text that has very long lines, it's very difficult to read. It, not, it doesn't just... A, apply to source code, it applies to all written text. One of the reasons is because if you're reading, for example, from left to right, to go from the end of one line to the beginning of the next is very difficult if the line is too long. Right, this is why most newspapers and magazines are multi-column. In an object-oriented programming, we require multiple windows to be open simultaneously, right? So having one window opening, open, occupying the entire screen space makes the mechanics of a programmer's job much more difficult, right? And this is a quote from Sun Microsystems way back in 1999. <clears throat> So rule number four is class variable names. All class variables start with the two-letter sequence M underscore, as in M meaning member variable. <clears throat> right? You have member variables that belong to a class, but then you have local variables that belong that are only belong in the scope of a method. And it's very, very useful to be able to see immediately, without thinking about it, which variables are member variables that belong to the class or have the, the, the scope of a class, and which ones are local variables that have only the scope of a local uh, method. And I still remember the first time I saw this rule, I was like, oh, that seems very awkward, you know, to have this M underscore in front of all the member variables. But actually, once you start using this rule, it becomes extremely useful. Uh, the only exception to this rule are symbolic constants. So symbolic constants are always written in capital letters. 
So we ba basically we want a rule that makes local variables e e very easy to distinguish from other types of variables. That's that's the basic motivation. Access or methods. Rule number five. <clears throat> So a symbolic, okay, somebody asked, what does a symbolic variable mean? I didn't use the term symbolic variable. I used the term symbolic constant. So a symbolic constant is a value that never changes. That's what a symbolic constant is. A very common example of a symbolic constant is pi. So instead of typing 3.1415, uh, 3.1415926 everywhere in your code, you replace it with a symbolic constant called pi, P-I. And then in, instead of typing in pi, you, you use this symbolic constant. I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> Rule number five is using accessor methods. So all class variables are accessed with accessor methods. For example, get methods and set methods, right? Get class variable, set class variable, with no exceptions. And the idea is this enforces encapsulation, which is one of the most important concepts in object-oriented methodology. This is one of the... Encapsulation is another way of uh, saying information hiding. As accessing member variables with methods makes the implementation very easy to change. So if I want to change a member variable, for example, from a float to an integer, if I'm already using accessor methods, it makes these modifications very easy. If you're not using accessor methods, it makes these changes, it can make these changes very, very difficult. Another great reason to follow this rule is to prevent unwieldy or even impossible search and replace operations. So I have seen in industry this rule not being used, which is not too surprising. And I have seen developers ch try to change a member variable from, from a float to an integer. And they've tried to do this with search and replace operations. And it can actually be impossible sometimes. If you haven't designed your software properly, you can actually make this job impossible because the, the variable can appear in so many different places that the developer loses track of every single place that it appears. And this problem gets exacerbated by the idea or the, the implementation when a variable appears across multiple files in multiple classes. This, I've seen this happen. I've seen people write variables that appear across multiple classes in multiple files and then they try to modify that variable and they've lost track of all the places it appears. And therefore it makes the search and replace operations, it can make them almost impossible, even impossible. Another reason is that a developer might need to check out, for example, five or six or more files to do a search and replace operation, but guess what? Other people might be using those files and developing them. So you requiring to check out, say, six or more files just to do a search and replace causes problems with other developers, right? You can avoid all of these headaches by using accessor methods. So all class variables are accessed with accessor methods, no exceptions. 
It does require some more upfront work, right? Because whenever you introduce a member variable, you automatically have to introduce the corresponding accessor methods. So what, what, what ends up happening is you're moving some of the work up front, right? Instead of pushing it further into the future, you're, you're moving the work up front and saving yourself a lot of future work. That's what ends up happening. Accessor methods, another rule on accessor methods, rule number six, accessor methods come at the top of both header files and implementation files. <clears throat> this is uh, really for C++, right? In Java, you only have one source code file. It's a Java file, and all of your methods are in there. Uh, <clears throat> you know, in C++, you have a header file and an implementation file. So, essentially, you can, kind, you can ignore this, you can ignore, well, not ignore this, but your accessor methods come at the top of the Java file, right? That's the idea behind this rule. So somebody has asked, can you define class variable quickly? Which ones are you referring to, the ones declared in the class but outside methods? Yes, so a, a member variable is is a is a variable that belongs to a class so as soon as you instantiate the class that variable is instantiated and that that it can be accessed from all of the methods inside the class and what I'm proposing is you always use accessor methods to access that variable this is opposed to a local variable it's a local variable is a variable you declare inside a method. So you, re, you write a method like hello world and then you declare a, a, a variable called string and then you store the string hello world in there. That's a local variable inside a method called hello world. So that's the difference between uh, member variable or class variable and local variable. I'm glad you guys are asking questions. You're asking more questions than usual today. That means people are awake, which is great. Keep the questions coming. Uh, rule number seven is all member class variables are private, right? The only exception to this is symbolic constants. Symbolic constants don't have to be private. So keeping class variables private enforces cap encapsulation, right? which is one of the fundamental concepts in object-oriented methodology. Only the class itself should know about the specific implementation details of its own data, right? So this is, this rule is something we've implied already over and over again, but now we're just making it black and white saying it's an official rule now. <laughs> Method naming. Okay, you can actually ignore this rule. This rule is a very handy rule for C++. I will just mention it briefly, but you can ignore it. You can see here, exception is Java. So the rule in C++ is private methods begin with a lowercase letter and public methods begin with an uppercase letter. This, does, this is not the same as the Java coding conventions. In Java coding conventions, the convention is classes are uppercase and methods are lowercase. But in C++, you, can, you could add this rule that pub, private methods are lowercase, public methods are uppercase. And it is incredibly useful, actually. It's incredibly useful to, to be able to see whether a, a, a method is private or public just by looking at the name without having to do any special kind of look up, look up like right-click and then looking up some information. 
Um, it just it makes the process much quicker. Essentially, it's 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 a really really handy rule. Um, I still remember when I first was introduced to this rule. Uh, once I started using it, I was like, oh, this is such a great rule because it just makes everything faster and easier and more convenient. But you can ignore that one, by the way. Rule number nine, method parameters. In general, methods do not require more than five parameters. So if you're writing a method that requires more than five parameters, something is wrong. You, that's a warning sign that something, that something has gone wrong. So the more methods, the more parameters a method takes, the less reusable it is. I'm sure you've all had this experience where you're trying to use a method but it requires lots of parameters and it makes the method more difficult to use. <clears throat> and if a method has too many parameters, it becomes, you know, every time you add a parameter, the more difficult it becomes to use. And maybe at some point it becomes almost impossible to use. Uh, somebody asked a question, why can rule number 8 be ignored by Java? It's just because Java has a slightly different naming convention. The Java naming convention is that all methods are lowercase and that all classes are uppercase. It's slightly different. It's a slightly different convention. So I won't, uh, we don't actually follow it. Yeah. I'm trying to get the king in the in the shot there. <clears throat> so method parameters avoid more than five parameters. The more parameters a method takes, the less reusable it is. <clears throat> the The better alternative is to have different implementations of the same method taking different but only a few parameters. We're actually going to talk about this in a lecture called protocols which is next week I believe. So we're going to we're going to talk about method protocols in detail, a special lecture dedicated just to methods and uh, good ways of de de designing methods and method signatures. So this is directly related to that lecture, which is next week. So too many method parameters, say six or more, may indicate problems with your software design. Does anybody know how to handle methods? If you're writing a method that requires six or more parameters, and it indicates a software design. Does anybody know what software design problem that indicates? That's a very advanced question. Um, if you know the answer to that question, you're in an advanced, your, your knowledge is advanced uh, because a lot of developers don't know the answer to this question. Usually, if you're writing a method with six or more parameters, the design flaw that that indicates is, the, is a missing class. It means that a class is missing in your design, generally speaking. And you need to think about your design and how to group related information and methods together in a class. That's what it generally means. Um, a long list of parameters may indicate that changes to the design are necessary. For example, the introduction of new classes or the rearrangement of existing classes. A question about the coursework. The coursework is not formally assessed. So, um, yeah. It's not formally marked. The top five 
the top five performers on the lab get a free laptop cover if they want. Mm. No, you do not have to add me as a, as a, uh, oh, for the coursework, okay. Uh, the coursework is going to be submitted using Moodle. Um, mm. Let's see, the lab is not marked, but the coursework is. So there are, there are questions coming in about the lab, and, and there are some that are coming in about the coursework. The lab is not assessed, but the coursework certainly is. Yes, it, yes, it would be good to add us, me and Pierre, as a member to your repository so we can see your uh, source code. And we're, we're going to be looking at the history of your source code, especially to see that you've made revisions to it over time. Uh, we can. We will release the final version of the coursework within the next week. So rule number ten is symbolic constants. Do not use numbers in your code, but rather symbolic constants. These are often called magic numbers. So. You, uh, this is actually the most common uh, rule that is violated. Uh, is, is magic numbers. Developers often are very tempted to enter a number directly into their code and then just leave it there. Uh, there, this causes many, many problems. So imagine you put in the number 6 in one method, and then in a different method you use the number 6 again. Those number 6s may represent two different things. Like, one might represent, for example, six fingers, and another one might represent six muffins. Just because the, the number 6 appears more than once in the source code, doesn't mean it represents the same thing. So, this causes massive, massive problems. Uh, using symbolic constants instead of typing numbers makes the code much more legible. Not only does the uh, using magic numbers cause problems when trying to um, make modifications, but if I put in the number 7 into my code, you might have no idea what that number 7 means or what it stands for. And even the original author eventually forgets what the number is. I've had many experiences where I see a number, a magic number inside of a source code file, and nobody knows what it is. I've even have this one memory of asking a fellow PhD candidate, I was looking at a PhD candidate's source code, and he was around, and I got to ask him, I said, Phil, like, what is this number? You have this number in your source code, what is it? And he looked at it, and he didn't know anymore. He had forgotten what that number is. And uh, because he wasn't following this rule number 10, using symbolic constants. <clears throat> also, the values of symbolic constants are very easy to change, right? It makes the code extremely easy to change. You only change the value of a symbolic constant in one location. So if you want to make an update to your code, it's trivial to do so when you're using symbolic constants. Changing the values of numbers directly in the code causes bugs, especially when the number appears in multiple places. This is a huge problem. If you see a number appearing in multiple places, it's a huge problem. Um, this is 
This rule is often articulated as do not use magic numbers. This rule is all over the place, by the way. It's in every set of coding conventions that exists in the entire world. Um, so somebody has asked, could 100 over 1000 be an exception to, for example, converting values from millimeters to centimeters? I would say no, this is not an exception. You would, if you have the, the uh, number 100, you could replace that with a symbolic constant called something like numerator, right? Here you're expressing a fraction. So you would replace the 100 with a symbolic constant called numerator, and then you would replace the, the 1000 with a symbolic constant called divisor or denominator. That would be a very generic case. Uh, but yes, you, there's no exception for 100 over 1000. You still would use symbolic constants in this case. Um, that's right. So symbolic constants make the code easier to read and they make it easier to change, right? That, that's, that's the idea. Mm. Okay, so I think what Warren means is 100 or 1,000. Could 100 or 1,000 be an exception to... No, I would not say, even if the question is 100 or 1,000, uh, I would definitely not use those numbers directly in your code. That's definitely not an exception. In fact, the question makes it even more compelling to use symbolic constants. Um, because if you have this choice between 100 or 1000, it's, that's very, very confusing. So no, you would definitely use symbolic constants. <laughs> If you're having trouble, you know, figuring out what symbolic constant to use, you can let us know and we can make some recommendations. <laughs> um, but yes, you would encapsulate a method like this in its own, uh, in its own method, but you would still use symbolic constants. You would still use them, yeah. Um, okay, any other, here's, a, here's a, a little, you know, sometimes I get backlash on these rules uh, for no good reason. <laughs> and as a, as a sort of a, a pedagogical exercise, I have these two methods. I'm showing one method on my screen and it's full of magic numbers. And so if we were in a classroom setting, I could actually give everybody a quiz and say, what do you think all of these magic numbers mean? So I could give everybody a quiz and say, okay, I have a method here, it's full of magic numbers, and I want everybody to tell me what the magic numbers are. Like, and, and that would be part of the quiz. Right, you can see the following magic numbers here, 0, 4, 3, 1, 2, 3, and 255. <laughs> and, then I can, and then I can ask you, what do you think that this method does? And then I can say, look, I'm going to write another version of the method that has no magic numbers in it, that uses symbolic constants instead, and I want you to tell me what the method does. And I can, I can, I can ask the class, okay, I can give you two versions of this method. You all have the same task to tell me what the method does. You can choose to get the version of the method with magic numbers, 
Or you can choose to get the version of the method with symbolic constants. You have the same, ta the same task. Tell me what the method does. And then I can ask the class, raise your hand if you want the version of the method with the magic numbers. Or raise your hand if you want the version of the method with symbolic constants. Right? Nobody in the classroom, unless they're feeling really rebellious, is going to say, I prefer the version of the method with the magic numbers in it for this task. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer this question more easily if I get the version of the method with uh, magic numbers. No, if I ask you what this method does, you want to see the version of the method without any magic numbers. So, that's what the next slide is. I've replaced all, well, I've replaced the magic numbers with symbolic constants. So you can see this new computation here, texture offset. I've replaced the 4, which is really magic, with a symbolic constant called the number of RGBA components. R being red, G being green, B being blue, and A being alpha. So now you know that that 4 that was appearing here, it actually stands for RGBA. Right, and here it is again, number of RGBA components, number of RGB components, that's this 3. There's a 3 here, I've replaced it with a symbolic constant, number of RGB components you would have no idea what that 3 was if I didn't put that symbolic constant in there. And then I've replaced the 255 with a symbolic constant called maximum alpha. So that's the maximum value that an alpha component can have. It's, it's from 0 to 255, right? So telling what this method does with symbolic constants is much easier than just trying to understand the method with magic numbers. Okay, I think um, there's, a, there's a second part of the lecture called Bob's Theory of Software Redevelopment, but I think I would say we're out of time now. Uh, you can read about Bob's Theory of Software Redevelopment in the coding conventions file itself. There's, it's got like the coding conventions is part one and then Bob's theory of software de redevelopment which is part two. And um, I will let you just read that as a fun exercise because we've already been going for a while, while now. Are there any other questions about the coding conventions, the lab or the coursework for now? So in the report, in the lab report, you put in, it, it, there's a copy, there's a set of the, the, the report there. It's just the number of errors you found. So for example, if you found a, a Java class and it has a hundred magic numbers in it, you would count up the number of magic numbers and then put a hundred next to the uh, rule number 10, I found a hundred magic numbers. So it's just an exercise, it's an exercise in searching and an exercise in counting. That's all it is. It's really, really easy, I would say. Any other questions? So the surprise I mentioned, very good, is in the lab. <laughs> you have to read the lab sheet <laughs> to find out the surprise. Well, the, the surprise is if you submit your report to the teaching assistant in the, in the uh, identified in the lab sheet, and you are one of the people that you, so what, what we're doing is we're finding the top five worst examples of Java source code. If you're one of the people that finds the top 
in the top five, then you can get a free laptop protector case. Uh, I have some extra laptop cases, protector envelopes in my office that I can give away. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's the surprise. Yes, so you just find, you just do a search for the code online. I've given you one website that you can look at. But you can find code from anywhere. That's part of the lab is to search for bad code. And um, when you find bad code, you, you, uh, you provide the URL in your report. You say, I found this bad code. Here's the URL where I found it. And then you submit that report to Alif, Alif the, the, the teaching assistant. <laughs> well, if, if, you, if you've written uh, really bad code, y you can submit that. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's a good exercise to go... Um, okay, this contest, this is kind of a contest. This ends at midnight tonight. So it, it can't go on forever. You'll see that in the lab sheet. It says you have to submit your report or email it to Alif by midnight tonight. Right? We don't want this thing to drag on forever. It's supposed to be fun. I it, like that's that's the idea. Yeah. Any other great questions? Someone asked if they can see the cat again. Hey, King. <clears throat> so the King wishes everybody um, success with the lab. Yes, you submit the, the, re the report together with the source code and the, the URL of where you got the source code. Uh, is very important. And it's also limited to one one class, one file. You do not submit a whole project. It's exact you have to find one class or one file. Like we don't want people submitting big things, big files. This is meant to be a fun, lightweight exercise. Like the report is extremely easy. It only takes a few minutes to type, like to, to fill in. Um, yeah, so don't be submitting emails with large attachments. Like the attachments should be very, very lightweight. Any other questions? The king is really looking forward to this to this lab too. Okay, I think I'll stop the presentation here and I'm looking forward to more questions and I'd like to thank the teaching assistants for their help. This is, it's, it's really, really great to have them helping. I really, uh, I really appreciate that and um, thank you very much.